out into different groups. Um, I've also put up here a series of questions that I want us to examine during this session. And the reason why I'm doing, partly one of the reasons why I'm doing it this way, um, aside from the fact that Randy asked us to explore different teaching methods, is when I've taught evolutionary medicine before, one of my concerns has been about the practical benefits of doing evolutionary medicine and, and how it can inform us about health issues. And one of the things I want us to do in this session is to explore um, this aspect in relation to early pubertal development. Um, what can we learn, if anything, from taking an evolutionary approach? Can we um, explore if there's anything practical for, cl for clinicians who are looking at specific cases of early pubertal development? Um, so I want us to examine our assumptions, um, issues of practicality, and in splitting up into groups, I am going to absolutely work on stereotypes, okay? Um, so you'll see from your handout that we have um, a scenario where we have an eight-year-old girl who's going to come in to see her clinician with her mum. I assume she wouldn't come in with her dad. There's nothing um, biased here. Um, now, if you think that an eight-year-old girl having menarche is unusual, it is unusual, but it's becoming more common. And I say that because in my work with Bangladeshis in Britain, and can I just say that, you know, there are poor Bangladeshis and there are quite well-off Bangladeshis, and I work with a middle-class, pretty affluent Bangladeshi group in Bangladesh who have the money to move to Britain. They tend to be on the very low end of the socioeconomic spectrum when they get to Britain, but in their own country, they're landowners, they have servants, etc. So they're not poor, and, and they don't look like the groups that Peter was showing earlier. So I just want to make sure that you realize that. But in the Bangladeshi populations in the UK that I work with, there are some girls who are reaching menarche at eight years old. And there are various tabloid presses that are always reporting on this as well. So it's, it is happening. Um, I want to stress that this, in this scenario, the eight-year-old girl does not have a pathology of any sort. So she doesn't have any condition, congenital condition, that would predispose her to this. She's, she's reached menarche for no um, you know, obvious pathological reasons. So that's good background for you. So let me um, very quickly set up our groups, and I'm going to go backwards. Um, I want to start off with um, the evolutionary biological group. And for this, I need people with a background in evolutionary biology, because I want us to explore you know, the kinds of backgrounds that we come from. So can I have people raise their hands who study evolutionary biology, who bio biological teachers? OK, great. Can I have you move over to this side of the room? People are going to be moving around, but can you move over there once I've got the groups organized? Um, my third group are medical doctors. So I want the medical doctors. Can you raise your hand? Okay, there are a bunch of you. I'm going to take you, but I'm also going to split you into two. So can those of you who work um, in anything to do with pediatrics or endocrinology raise their hands? Okay, you guys will make one group, and then the rest of you will make another. I'll keep you in the middle. The pediatric reproductive endocrinology guys will be in the front, and the other guys in the back. Okay, group two, we have a mum who's presumably, or mom, I should say, I guess, um, who's presumably anxious about her eight-year-old daughter. Are any of you here, the females, obviously, um, or there could be males who are acting as mums, but um, who have kids who would like to play this part? Okay, can I have some more females without kids who can imagine this scenario? I need more than two people, so if I can have just a few more. Okay. Okay, great. So if you guys could be the mums and you work over in the front here. And then finally, I want a group of people, anyone who's left, can you raise your hand, those who aren't already in a group? I want you to discuss and recreate what you think the girl's phenotype is. Do you understand what I mean by phenotype? Is anyone not clear about that? If you're not, I'll come to your group to save time and just explain what I mean by that. But, you know, what she looks like, her characteristics and so forth. Um, and I want you to um, follow the instructions on this handout. I'm going to give you 10 minutes, because that's basically all that we have. At the end of that 10 minutes, I'm going to have each group report back, starting with group one. You're going to explain to us. So you might need to have a spokesperson for your group. Um, come up to the front, your spokesperson, and tell us what that phenotype is. And I'm going to have then audience participation, criticisms, um, that sort of thing, so you get feedback. And then um, group two um, will come up, and the mothers will explain why they took the daughter to the doctor. I mean, if your daughter reached menarche at anywhere between, say, 11 and 14, you probably wouldn't go to the doctor. 
but you have because your daughter's eight. So let's discuss why and the mother's concerned, and we'll have some feedback. Are there other concerns we should be worried about? Um, then the doctors um, will have the two groups. We're going to have you tell us what you do with this girl who comes into the doctor's office. Are you going to treat her medically? Are you going to do something else? What would you say to the mum? And then the evolutionary biologists at the end will come up and they'll say, well, give us their perspective so we can learn something about how an evolutionary perspective might help us, or maybe it doesn't. And I think that's equally important. You know, maybe we can't learn something from this scenario about early pubertal development, and I think that's something worth discussing. Um, because certainly I know a lot of medical doctors who I've had in my classes always say, well, this is very interesting, but how does it help me in my clinical practice? So let's explore some of those issues too. Okay, so are you all clear about where you're going to? Physically, in your groups? So can you all move around? And I'm going to give you 10 minutes, okay, to discuss. And we sort of settled on she's more likely to be overweight and um, along with that may show some um, sort of early onset uh, other secondary sex characteristics, breast development, um, hair growth, stuff like that. Um, we settled on, on that phenotype in part. I was arguing for that in part because I've worked with a lot of kids in the, you know, eight to 15-year-old range, and the ones I've known of to have early menarche tend to be on the more overweight side. Um, but we also thought about, um, uh, in uh, Peter's presentation, adult females who are very low body weight tend to stop getting their, um, their period. So we, um, that's where we, where we settled for body type. Um, otherwise, you know, we said she could probably be of any racial or ethnic background. Um, Jack was saying she probably looks sort of unremarkable. Um, and, um, but uh, probably would have higher levels of sex hormones than a, maybe a more typical eight-year-old girl. Um, she may have experienced some nutritional change that might have triggered this early onset um, menarche. Um, and then we also discussed her behavioral, the behavioral aspects of her phenotype, and we really said it, it could be anything. Um, you know, maybe she'd show sort of um, more sexualized behaviors than her peers, uh, given her body changes. On the other hand, she might uh, be very sort of shy and, um, and reserved, uh, sort of in terms of um, being you know, ashamed or embarrassed about um, this stuff. So that's as far as we got. Um, we, that came up. We didn't really settle on it. My own just com completely sort of anecdotal uh, answer to that question would be um, sort of medium to shorter height. But I, I have no idea if that bears out. That's just like the girls that I've known who've experienced this. But I don't know if other people in the room have thoughts about that. Sure. We think that she might have just had a little growth spur, um, but we can't remember how tall she is right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not very good. Does anyone else want to comment on the phenotype that we created for it? I mean, do you think it helps limit the phenotype that's like this white as well, or are you happy with that? And then, you know, at the end, when we discuss, when everybody's discussed their group, how do we visit what you haven't seen? And we'll have a bit of a discussion. Yeah, we said she, she likely had experienced those things. Um, and I'll, I'll on the spot answer how the girl is feeling about this. She's feeling extremely embarrassed and, you know, why is this happening to me? Okay, great. Let's move on to the mom. 
some of these are always made for men, right? So <laughs> just clipping on my little. Yeah, I will. Okay, so I'm up here representing the mothers. I think that we all. So I have a five-year-old daughter, two-year-old son, and you guys, you five-year-old and nine. nine. I'm imagining a daughter. You're, she's imagining a daughter. So, okay, so we should say that our first response to this was, yeah, you know, to think about our, our girls that, are, that we think of as little girls as being so, possibly going through this rather large transition in their lives. So when we thought about it in, you know, the age of the internet, Right, we're, we're a good mom and so we, our daughter goes through this and we go and Google it and get freaked out and then go to the doctor and I'm sure that as the doctors can attest, we're like your worst nightmare, right? We come in with a little bit of information but perhaps enough to be freaked out but not necessarily to really know what's going on. And so I think that our first reaction and the first thing we would come to with the doctor is, is there something wrong? Is there something medically wrong with our daughter? You know, is there something wrong with is it her pituitary? Is it something with her thyroid? Is there something wrong with her hormones? You know, is it, is it a weight you know, mediated problem like they talked about? Um, I know that this says that there aren't any um, obvious changes, but we don't know that you know, going into the doctor. So we would be like, what's wrong? Is there something wrong? Um, I think one of our next big concerns would be um, what are the short and long term effects on our daughter's health going to be from this? Um, both in terms of physical health, so in terms of is this going to stunt her growth, is it going to increase her risk of cancer, is it going to um, um, do anything from that side, but also the psychological side, like, you, like was mentioned in the, in the previous group. Is this going to, what is her relationship going to be with her peers now? You know, how is this going to affect her you know, social interactions at school, both with other girls, but also with boys, you know, this, this is an eight-year-old girl. Many of us were talking about that. We probably haven't had the sex talk with her yet. You know, you probably even discussed this stuff. And so is this going to make her, I don't know, more promiscuous or something like that? You know, these are the concerns that we would have as, as mothers. Um, and then being, you know, good mothers who try to balance many things in our lives and continually beat ourselves up, the, the next natural place to go would be, did I do this to her? You know, was not only is there something medically wrong, but is it, is it me? Did I feed her the wrong foods? You know, we discussed, I mean, obviously we're scientists, so we know things about a lot of the estrogen mimics that are out there, the BPA, these things, you know. Did we, did, because we used this baby bottle or didn't breastfeed her long enough or, you know, blah, 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 did we do this to her? We fed her the McDonald's, you know, is it, is it our fault? Um, what caused it? So that kind of links back to, is there something medically wrong? But what, what caused this? And then finally, um, we would want to know, what do we do about it? What can we do about it? Should we do something about it? I mean, are there, you know, do we start now messing with her hormone levels? Or do we just kind of let this ride out? So I think that that was where, where do you guys have anything? Oh, and then the other thing, yeah, is this something that could run within the family, right, if there are genetic causes of it, and should we worry about her younger sister? Or, you know, if we caused it because we're bad parents and fed her McDonald's and there were estrogen mimics, is her, you know, younger brother now going to be sterile or something? You know, just how is this going to affect or possibly affect younger siblings as well? It would be terrifying. So maybe the nine-year-old? So you have a nine-year-old. How would your nine-year-old react, do you think? I think it depends on which, whether I debriefed her about this or not ahead of time. So we're assuming that this daughter would not debrief about this. So that's probably pretty, pretty shocking. I, w I would say, yeah. I would say shocked and scared. And yeah, feel like they were saying maybe feel weird or yeah, that something's wrong. Yeah. I know. I can just, I mean, I know my daughter's five, but it's just the idea of three years from now having that go through it is just. Terrifying. I don't want to think about that. Right now she loves me a lot. So I don't want to think about that time. <laughs> so I did two weeks of pediatric endocrinology, so I don't know about specialists, but I'll do the best I can. 
So I guess, I mean, a lot, kind of the stuff that you uh, um, talked about were some of the things that we would first address. Um, eight year old, an eight year old with menarche is kind of on the border. So before eight is considered like, at least in our world, kind of abnormal. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of on the border. Um, the first things that we'd want to know is what are mom's concerns? What are, what are the child's concerns? And, and I, th I think that you kind of illustrated that very well. Um, and then the, really the next thing would be, um, I guess, knowing what the, would be reassurance, which is what is done a lot in a lot of pediatrics. And when I was in pediatric endocrinology, that was one of the main interventions was reassurance and then versus doing a medical intervention. And I guess that would be based on one, uh, kind of some of your concerns and two, the, 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 one of your questions was what would be the problem with, or what would be the um, kind of like the medical thing that we'd have to worry about. And that one of those was height, I think you mentioned, or maybe you didn't mention it, but that would be one of the things. So in, in uh, after menstruation, the way I understand it is that there is not a lot of time left after that to, 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 to get height. So um, I guess it depends on um, uh, kind of where she is in the growth curve. And then you look and see kind of where, where she's gonna fall out in the next several years. Um, and if that's gonna be kind of on the low to, to normal, then I think there'd be less reason to worry. Whereas, you know, if she's four, 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 five now, and that's gonna be it, then maybe there'd be concern and, and maybe you'd wanna do an intervention versus reassurance and the intervention would be like um, Lupron. Um, and so um, the other thing would be, the, and then the three concerns that I would think about would be, so one would be, um, would be height. And the second would be, I think you touched on it as well, is uh, there's an increased sexual interest in older boys and older men, and, um, and so that is gonna become a, a, social, a social aspect that they would need to be considered. So I guess based on all of that, I guess in summary, um, you would consider, and the, when the first thing that you would kind of do is you could get some hand films to see where, to see where she's at in her growth. Um, so you could kind of assess where she's gonna fall in the growth curve um, and then from there you can decide based on kind of a whole bunch of information, including where she is on her height, um, how scared mom is about, about um, her, her maturing sexually earlier, and how, how the child feels. Um, and I think probably, most likely, it's going to be, since she's just right at that border at eight, it's probably going to be reassurance versus doing a very expensive medical intervention. I don't know if I did this right, so... I believe I, I don't I don't prescribe this, but that we were saying the um, it's Lupron, I believe it is, right? Pediatric friends, I think it's a very expensive, I think it's an expensive horm uh, hormone therapy. The other thing I forgot to mention in even in family history would be seeing what mom's menarche was, and if that and if what sister's menarche was, if there's an older sister, and if those were all, oh yeah, it was like eight and a half, oh yeah, you know, it was right. I mean, then it'd be like, well. How tall are you, mom? This is likely following a familial pattern, and she's likely to be a lot like you and your sister. And, and her sister. And I think but again, kind of in summary, if, if this were me and it was my, and I was in clinic, I would, and it was the same as mom, the same as the sisters, I would give reassurance. Eight-year-old is on the spectrum of normal. I would say, I would say you're probably going to be okay. But. I think the. Um, I think the uh, non-pediatric physician take will be very similar to what you just heard with the uh, pediatric physician take. Um, our response is, obviously, since this is not the usual presentation for Menarche and mom's bringing the child in with concerns, we're going to address both those issues. And um, our initial concerns were obviously with uh, pathological states, so I think the diligent physician would make sure that there are not inherent pathologies and so forth. We're told that this is not a pathological entity, but I, you know, um, once, once we've made that determination and we decide that this is an extreme in the normal distribution of, you know, what can be considered normal human experience, um, I, I think our take was very similar is that we would do reassurance and that we would respond to mom's concerns. Bearing in mind that sometimes pathology is not immediately apparent 
at the time that presentation occurs. And so there would be appropriate observation to make sure that something didn't appear pathological that was not apparent when um, the child first came in. And I think due diligence would also um, in, involve seeking correctable factors, looking at things like obesity. Um, and uh, then we've talked about a number of things here. I think that our focus would be on addressing modifiable risks. Um, and um, we would provide support services along with the reassurance, and this would include both education, counseling, support services, maybe support groups if available, those kinds of activities. Um, there was a bit of a discussion about the fact that those support services would probably have to be tailored to uh, the specific needs of the individual, recognizing that socioeconomic status, uh, the emotional maturity of the child, the available social support system, um, the maternal, uh, other family experience would all be relevant in those situations. Obviously, if mom had menarche at, at age eight, um, um, then the, the little girl had two sisters had menarche at age eight, that's a very different experience and background, and, and mom's concerns are going to be very different than if uh, comes in and her sisters each had menarche at 13 and 14, and mom was very late. So um, it... it it doesn't, you know, directly address the issue, but, you know, we recognize that uh, a lot of the support services would have to be tailored to the, um, the experience that they're coming in. And also, there was some note that, you know, different cultural backgrounds going to be um, relevant in how we address these issues. Looking forward, you know, um, addressing the concerns about the pathologic instances, those reassurance uh, issues are going to be, the, you know, of premier importance to, to mom. But looking forward, you know, addressing issues that are going to be of concern to any mother um, with a teenage daughter, they're going to have to be moved forward. And so, um, and, the, and uh, you know, things like teenage pregnancy, uh, disparities between emotional and physical maturity, um, all of those are going to have a, a heavy impact. And so we don't have a specific prescription, but I think we would, you know, try and provide whatever support service were called for by the specific instance and what's going on. Um, and I think that addresses the concerns that were raised when you came up. Is something wrong? And is my daughter at risk? And um, I'm not sure that we really added much to the discussion beyond what was already with the first group. But I, I think there's enough concordance that I think the physicians are in agreement. Well, I, you know, um, obviously an ultrasound would be relevant looking for anatomic abnormalities, um, you know, um, uh, pediatric hormonal profile, biochemical profiles uh, are fairly well known. There, you know, there there are enough differences between um, um, a prepubescent and an adolescent individual that I think one can look at, at consistency for normal development and look for patterns that would like signal something different. I mean, obviously, if you had a mass in the abdomen and you had an abnormal, you know, profile, it would just you would look for things that, that would not be typical for uh, normal development. This is just happening to occur in someone who's chronologically eight years old. But I think you would evaluate it exactly the same way, but with more attention as you would as someone who came in with menarche at 12 years old, except you would probably just take it more at face value. It's just because it's an outlier and you're assuming it's normal, you're still going to examine more closely. This is not my particular uh, area of expertise, so I'm not sure I'm addressing your... your <laughs> no, I, I don't think anybody recommended specifically doing anything. I don't think anybody would suppress the menses or that anybody would actually do, do anything interventional. I mean, you know, if you're assuming that this is a normal outlier, you, you know, what you're going to try and do is, if I'm reading my response and in, in, in the response of the group, is that we're going to address the collateral issues that go along with early menarche and just try and shepherd this individual along as if they were an older person, recognize they may not have all the coping skills and uh, support services that someone at an older age would be. You're going to compensate. You're going to help them compensate for that disparity. Okay, so this person is coming from Bangladesh and is now going to Northern Europe. Um, uh, lifestyle is very different, but the other thing to remember that in addition to lifestyle. Um, nutritional status and the consumption of various foods and the exposure to an environment is very different. Uh, 
Why do you say that? Oh, I see. Oh, okay. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, this particular person is now going to be exposed to uh, nutrients and potentially chemicals that they would have not been exposed to in their homeland, where they originally came from. Now look at it this way. If you are in a country where resources may be somewhat limited, and as we learned yesterday, it probably is to your advantage to maybe delay um, your menses, or at least be of a size and stature and nutritional status where you can have a successful reproductive event, then you, what you would have, you would have those receptors, those signal transduction pathways that would be more exquisitely sensitive to limiting amounts of the nutrients that would be there that would allow you to reproduce. And so if your receptors had binding constants that were far greater than what you would see in the northern European population, then that little bit of a cholesterol derivative that could be converted to pregnenolone, which then would be converted to a hormone, that little bit would now bind with a much higher affinity and therefore it would trigger events much earlier than you would expect. Same thing could be true with various signal transduction pathways. If there are rate limiting enzymes in the northern European population that allow delay of the reproductive event that are at a much higher level in the underdeveloped population such that now you're consuming dairy products that you never would have seen before. The dairy products might be spiked with hormones that help the cows grow better and produce more milk. Your body is seeing all of this, yet your body is geared up to act on very small amounts of it. Now you're flooding the system with it. And so evolutionarily, you've evolved the mechanism to deal with tiny amounts, but now you're getting hit with large amounts. And so therefore, the event gets triggered earlier. What could you do about it? Well, we've heard some of those therapies right now that we talked about that were drug intervention. But I suppose what I would do is interview the family and say, what are you eating now that you weren't eating before? What are you doing now that you weren't doing before? What, a bunch of Pop-Tarts and, and milk? Why don't we cut back on that? Fewer video games, get out and get some exercise. Strategies like that. The other things that one could also do, in, in addition to finding out what the, the family histories are in terms of what the environment was at the previous place and what the environment is now, is to make sure that these sorts of things are modulated such that it may be um, a gradual transition into the lifestyle um, rather than maybe an all at once. Because I think that what this eight year old is now seeing is a bunch of molecules that she has never, her body has never seen before. And so that these rate limiting pathways and these high affinity receptors, whether it's again, pregnenolone derivatives, cholesterol derivatives, something like that, um, are not overwhelmed. And so that would be that strategy. Oh, oh, what the moms? Well, the moms don't know because the Bangladeshi mom is now going to the grocery store for the first time and seeing things that may, may not have seen before. So, and she's probably listening to the mom down the street saying, oh yeah, this is what you give, this is what we feed, or, you know, eight-year-old school lunches. No control there at all. This is what they have in those school lunches. Well, the Northern European kids, that's what they've grown up on. That's what the generation before and the generation before, but not the case here. So I really think it's at the molecular level, probably a one in terms of signal transduction, but also, you know, we have so many hormones in our food, in the meat products, which have cholesterol in them. Cholesterol and cholesterol derivatives are really uh, the backbone. If you look at those fused rings of cholesterol, are the backbone of the sex hormones. So that would be the evolutionary perspective. Yeah, I, 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 I think evolutionarily, for generations where these people have lived previously, um, access to the same sorts of nutrients and chemicals were non-existent or quite limiting, and so therefore their bodies would be able to grab on to the little bits that were there. Whereas in the new environment, that is no longer a rate-limiting molecule, and so then the body just exploits what is available.
tens or hundreds of generations separating the two, but you know, nutrient availability was limiting in Europe prior to refrigeration. So has there been enough time to see that evolution? <laughs> yeah, I, I say absolutely, because it could be just a single gene, a single SNP, a single amino acid change in phosphofructokinase that now shows no citrate regulation of that. So I think so. I think, I think it could be, if it's a rate limiting step on a signal transduction pathway, if it's the active site of a receptor, if it's some little pocket the way a protein folds into a third dimension, that could be a single amino acid. That could be a SNP, a single nucleotide change. So I would maintain yes. Yeah, because otherwise, if they're already producing too early, they would have maybe the consequences that we learned about earlier today and yesterday. So I, I think that's why it would be selected out of the population. I think probably the former, where you're talking about a genetic difference. Well, Oh, again. No, but see, the thing is, is that, again, there are so many different steps involved. And if you look at, for example, signal transduction and how it sets up an enzyme cascade, and there's various little places that can be rate limiting anywhere along the way. So now she's exposed to a chemical or an allosteric modifier that affects just one of those, and their, her family or the, that population happens to have an amino acid change in that pathway, it could trigger this tremendous event. So I, I, think, um, I, I think it's amazing how maybe one little amino acid change could end up with this big result, eight-year-old. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, you had your hands up. The only thing I can think of there is that, you know, that's a basic sugar, that's a metabolite, that is something that you actually consume as a nutrient, whereas a hormone can act catalytically rather than stoichiometrically. So I think something like lactose, which would act stoichiometrically because it's a nutrient, would have a very different effect than a hormone which acts catalytically, where a tiny amount can have a profound effect. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm just going to do a really quick wrap-up, and then we can have some coffee. Um, I think that was really interesting to hear all of your perspectives. Um, I mean, I have to say I was a little surprised by the response from the evolutionary group, more because I expected you to just put it more into a sort of macro perspective, talking about trade-offs and things like that. But it was, it was really fascinating. You came up with something different, and I think that gives us a lot of grounds for discussion afterwards, and we can pursue these. But yeah, I would add, Peter mentioned the word epigenetic, and I would expect that if there was going to be such a rapid 
effect on a girl, it's much more likely that it would be something epigenetic. But let's continue that conversation afterwards. Um, just, just want to bring up a couple of other things. Um, there was only the mention of exercise once, which I was quite surprised about, because there's a big literature talking about how girls are becoming more sedentary. And, you know, of course, the literature about the effects of sports medicine, um, exercise in general. I would be recommending these moms, if they haven't already done so, to take the girls, you know, to make sure they're doing a bunch of exercise in general, just for the health, if nothing else. Um, and it raises questions about what's going on in schools, you know, cutting back on recreation facilities and so forth. Um, the other thing, people didn't mention anything about birth weight of this girl, and I think that might have been very interesting to explore because there is a literature that talks about how girls who are born small for gestational age and then experience catch-up growth are much more at risk for things like, um, not necessarily early menarche, but sometimes that happens, but for early secondary sexual characteristics developing. That could have been something that, that, um, we, you know, that we could talk about at some point. Um, the fatness, you know, I did expect that. I have to say I expected people to say that the girl was overweight. And again, this raises issues in terms of, you know, the evolutionary <coughs> scenario. This girl has the resources available for early reproduction, and she's channeling herself into this pathway, um, you know, a sort of extending the reproductive lifespan, reaching a, a state of fecundity earlier. And, um, you know, in the literature as well, there is a literature that supports the idea that if you have menarche earlier, you also spend less time in what's called adolescent subfecundity. So if you have an early menarche, you're going to be starting to have robust ovarian cycles early. So that's an important thing to consider for this sexuality question and, um, you know, whether or not you can get pregnant. Uh, just um, another couple of things, just practically. Um, and this just came up being a mum, my daughter's gone through menarche, but when she was in school, in primary school, there were a couple of girls in her class who did reach menarche early, and that raised this whole practical question among the mums, provision of, you know, facilities for girls for feminine hygiene, and, hi, you know, junior schools, primary schools are not thinking about that. And with this, um, you know, the decline in the age at menarche, that there is a literature out there that is suggesting that this is, that menarche is continuing to decline, or at least very recently, there may be an, uh, you know, a continuation of decline. We need to be concerned about this. Um, the other thing that I would raise is, there is a literature that I have a, a PhD student exploring about whether breast development is moving earlier independent of menarche, and the, you know, there's suggestions, whether it's right or not, about the environmental xenoestrogens, phthalates, you know, BPA, all these things, whether that's responsible. I think we need to think about these issues and explore those. Um, and yeah, so I think I'll stop there. We've got lots to think about. You know, thank you for your participation. Um, it, you know, if anyone wants more literature about early puberty and its consequences, I'm happy to give you references. And um, hopefully this will also give our groups who are dealing with reproduction some more food for thought about what they might concentrate on for their work groups. So thanks a lot.